All right, we have we have a complete unknown Emily Swallow. And no, you both showed up. Look at this. This is double the audience that was here for Tom Arnold. <laughs> I mean, I'll do my best. Make up a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so, so what? Some of us love Emily for her work that she did on uh, Supernatural. I'm upset that there are more. The, uh, <laughs> but most of us are here because of our work on The Mandalorian. Yeah. But I want to start out, I want to start out back early in your career. Uh, uh, a couple of Utah kids, uh, one from the University of Utah, Jeremy Rich from the U of U, went to school with you at NYU Tisch, and he said that you are an exceptional musical theater actor. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I started out, uh, most of the performing I did when I was younger was, was musical theater. Yeah. Do you still sing? Oh, yes. Do you, are you willing to sing anything for us? Do you have any requests? <laughs> Will you guys sing with me? What should you say? Carry on my wayward son. Okay, carry on my wayward son. Let's get it. Let's go. Carry on my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. What comes next? Let your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Now we need to get air guitar. <laughs> And I get nervous every time, like, I have to sing it because I'm convinced I'm going to totally blank on the words and then everyone will hate me. So, I'm glad that didn't happen. So, <laughs> so in Supernatural, you played the darkness. Darkness, God's sister. And, and, uh, and tell me about, about how that is different. A lot of the characters that you play are, are always sort of leadership people or in charge of people or powerful people. How is, how is being the darkness different than, I don't know, your early days in Shakespeare? <laughs> well, I mean, it, there were a lot of similarities because I think, um, you know, what I can connect to with Amara, because I, I have nothing to draw on to say, I wonder what it feels like to be a deity. Um, but I could definitely relate to her feelings of, um, of hurt and loneliness and feeling misunderstood. And I think there's a lot of characters in Shakespeare who are like that and who express that in huge ways. Um, and in Shakespeare, it's with the text. With Amara, it's more with, you know, smiting people and sucking souls, like you do. Um, but it, I, I love that you, you mentioned Shakespeare because I felt like in the episode where I finally got to confront Chuck, um, it sort of felt like this like Greek theater confrontation because finally, you know, I was getting to ask him why he had done all the things he had done and kind of pour out everything that was in my heart. And so it, it felt very theatrical. Yes. It was really fun. So the real honest emotion. Yeah. Sense. So one of the things I want to know, you're, you started in, in Shakespeare, you started on Broadway. When, when we had uh, Patrick Stewart here in the Grand Ballroom, he said his dream was to just spend his life saying the words of Bard and not be on television. How has that transition been for you? What do you like more? Broadway stage, Shakespeare, television, what speaks to you? I don't like to choose because I love it all for different reasons. Um, I do miss, whenever I'm doing TV and film, I really miss the audience. And that's one of the reasons I love getting to do conventions so much, because you are an integral part of the storytelling process, and it feels incomplete until I get to talk to you, and I get to hear your reactions, and I get to, I get to learn from you, because <laughs> the people in, in the, the fandoms usually know more than I do about the shows that I'm on. Um, so I, it's, it's a constant learning process. Um, but yeah, I mean, I... I love the collaboration of theater. I love that it is so in the moment and will never happen that way again. I also love when I'm doing TV and film that I can do multiple takes and if one doesn't go well, that's all right. Um, but it's also, I feel like film and TV is, you're putting your trust in the process as a whole in a much greater way, which is really cool because you know, you know, you don't know how it's going to be edited, you don't know, when I was doing Super
supernatural. And when we were shooting scenes where I had to like just hold my arm out and trust that somebody was going to be destroyed, I felt like an idiot. <laughs> Those scenes where I had to suck somebody's soul, ridiculous. Because after the fact, they added the CGI and there was like, you know, smoke going between our mouths. When we were shooting it, it felt so stupid. It's just two people standing there with their your mouth's wide open. Really awkward. So I, I enjoy getting to go back and watch things that I've shot to see all of the other work that's done on it. But I think like in the moment of performing, I love theater more because it's just so immediate. Beautiful. Now in The Mentalist, you played a very high level FBI agent who uh, had to lure the star back from uh, being on a desert island because you were so uh, sexy and desirable that, that you, were, you were even able to fool the mentalist. I mentalist in the mentalist. You did. And originally you were just going to be a, a day player on a few episodes and you became a regular character. Or were you always going to be a regular character? As far as I know, I was always going to be a regular character. Because you were built differently on the first three episodes uh, of the and later. I think that's probably because they didn't want to give it away. Uh, that I would be... Because when... For those of you who don't know, I, uh, the first couple of episodes I was in, I was pretending just to be this random woman that Patrick Jane met on this um, exotic island. And I think maybe they didn't want to give away to the audience that I was who I was. So sure. don't, don't check the credits to know who the villain is. Yeah. So good. The villain? <laughs> People did get mad at me for fooling him. But then I spent the entire remainder of my time on the show, every single episode, you know, being one of the people who's like, there's no way he'll figure it out, and then, oh, we figured it out. You even gave him his couch, it was so nice. Yes. So, then you went, and now we've done so many shows, I mean, we don't have time for all the shows, but The Mandalorian, when, when you, I read, read and also saw in the interviews that you gave, that at first you weren't sure that you were auditioning for a Star Wars project. No, they're very mysterious. They continue to be very, very mysterious. Um, we are often, the actors, we're often the last to know about what we're going to be doing. Um, yes, it, it, I knew it had something to do with Star Wars, but of course The Mandalorian hadn't been announced or anything, so I had no frame of reference, um, and I had no script or anything to look at, so I just, and, and that happens with a lot of projects where you get very little, especially, you know, these days with DC and Marvel, and they don't want to give away anything. So you get scenes for an audition, and you just have to use your imagination and make up a lot of uh, a lot of the given circumstances and a lot of other details, because they're not going to tell you anything. And that was the case with that. Now, on the Mandalorian, she was the armorer, I most well was the armorer who appeared in multiple episodes as sort of the spiritual guide for the Mandalorians and also the one that created the special armor and created the armor for the foundlings and others. How did you reach into all of that to sort of create someone who both was, was this strong, powerful character of, of a blacksmith as well as this spiritual leader? Um, well, one of the... I'm trying to remember what, how the, the layers were, were built. Um, what I knew from the audition is that she was the leader of a group of people who were in hiding. They said she was very zen-like. Um, and then it just struck me, I, I remember from the audition I had to say, this is the way. That was a phrase that was repeated a few times. And that immediately struck me as something sacred. Um, and I did get the sense from the writing that she was someone who was the keeper of, the keeper of stories, the keeper of history. Um, and that felt very sacred, and, and I think because of the way she sort of guides Mando, she feels a little to me like the, you know, Star Wars has so many great mentor characters, and she feels like one of those, like an Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, and, uh, and so I definitely latched onto that, and something that John told me just before we started filming was that he, in the same way that George Lucas had drawn from a lot of Kurosawa films, um, for this character especially, they, they've used that as a reference, and so thinking about kind of the samurai order and that formality and that simplicity uh, was incredibly helpful. Um, and it was really fun to, to put on somebody like that, because in, in, in real life I'm, I'm fidgeting all the time, I use my hands a lot, I use my face a lot, 
and she just seemed like somebody who would have a lot more stillness and be a lot more uh, economical in her movement, which was also handy because it turns out it's really hard to see in that helmet. Um, and so I was always wondering if I was going to trip on something or run into something, and there were a number of times when a couple of Mandalorians would bonk helmets, and it was more like a Three Stooges sketch than Star Wars. Uh, but fortunately, editing comes into play, and it looks great. It's great. So, so because I love call and response theater, that's where we say something and everybody responds. Could you, could you, and everybody play along, could you give us in, in accent a this is the way? Only if I can record it. <laughs> well, I'm creating moments like this for us. All right, ready? Yeah. This is the way. This is the way. Well oh, done. One more time, bigger. Let's do a bigger for her recording. This is the way. This is the way. It's a really handy phrase. It is. It comes in handy in, in so many different situations. Live long and prosper, and then do that, and this is the way. Yeah. The end is so many great phrases. I've spoken. Also with you. I've spoken. So you, uh, uh, I, I uh, want well, to know you played, so this character is British. Why did, why did the character become British English? That was because in the audition, I was asked, uh, by the, and, and the audition was so low-key, which also made me go, am I really auditioning for Star Wars? Because there was nobody involved with the show in the room. Um, it was just me and the, the casting associate, a gentleman named Jason. And he said that they had mostly been seeing British women in their 50s and 60s for the part. So he asked me to do a take with the accent. So that's how that happened. And then um, I think... John liked the way that it sort of set her apart from everybody else, so it stuck. Great. We have a, we have a way in America that we feel the British accents are smarter than us. <laughs> we, have, we have that paternalism going on. Well, and it's particularly satisfying as an American because there's so many Brits who come and do wonderful American accents. And I'm not going to say they take our parts, but, you know, there's a little, a little competitiveness there. So it's satisfying. That for her and for Lisa in Castlevania, that I successfully fooled everyone. Oh, so good. All right, I want to. I have some more questions, but I want to open up if you want to ask questions. We have two microphones in the middle and in the middle back there that you can line up at, and we can start asking questions right here. What do, is there any project you're working on right now that you're allowed to talk about? No. Okay. Nothing <laughs> to talk about. That's the problem. She is working. All right. Coming up first. Uh, who did you work with the most on The Mandalorian, like John Favreau or Dave Filoni, or did, was there three different directors you worked with? In your there were three different directors. John was there for every episode, though. Um, and he, I just can't say enough about what an incredible leader and team builder he is. I mean, not only is he brilliant, but he's just so good at making sure that everyone in the room feels heard and included and important, and I think that he's so talented at drawing the best out of people. So he was there sort of overseeing, but it was never, um, the directors absolutely had the last say, you know, was, each episode was their episode. So I worked with um, Dave and uh, Deborah Chow at the same time because we were shooting one and three concurrently. Um, and then I worked with Taika YTT for the last one, which was just like a bucket list item of mine because I think he's insane and brilliant. Um, so John was the one, I guess, that was there more than anyone else. Dave was there most of the time, too. Um, but yeah, those, those four, they were my, my guidance. Great question. And those episodes, your episodes of The Mandalorian were shot before The Mandalorian was announced. Yeah. Right. I finished all my work on the show before it was ever announced, and I'm so glad for that, because I never... I mean, you know, I knew I was working with, like, John Favreau and Dave Filoni, and these are really impressive people, but... I didn't know any of the hype around the show, and so I didn't have a chance to get nervous about that. Just another day at work. Just another day. Next up, what's your name? Hi, I'm Xavier. Hello, Xavier. Hi. Hi. So, I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but because I have a bunch of variety of genres that you would act in and voice act in, if you could pick a character from any genre or a show you um, you're a fan of or something, and have the ability to that character oh to just be that character with all that character's powers oh 
courageous. With great power comes great responsibility. Um, I know, I want that responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I could be Amara after she stops smiting people and, and just go hang out in Reno and gamble. And apparently do some really great shopping. I love her, her wardrobe after she finally decided that maybe wearing the same dress every day <laughs> didn't have to happen. I like that. Thank you for the help. Next up, we have a member of Cobra Kai strike first. <laughs> no mercy. Yeah. So, uh, you and I talked a little bit yesterday about uh, Castlevania, but the one thing I did not ask, do you have any experience whatsoever with the video games? I'm, I, I heard video games. What did you say before that? Do you have any experience whatsoever with the video games? Of Castlevania? Yes. I remember, yeah, I remember the Atari game. I played it when I was when I was younger. I haven't revisited it in my adulthood. Did you play them? Oh, yeah. Do you feel like the series faithfully represents them? For the most part. Good. I'll take that. That's enough. We have other people online, so I'll let them know. Now, it's, uh, Thank you. it's unfair. It, it's, she can't look this way and be old enough to have played Atari. I hate it. All right. Oh, yeah. No, I remember, for those of you young people in the audience, I remember this game that we had on Atari that was, um, it was maybe some like, it was a track and field game, and there was uh, a decathlon. But to make your little, your little avatar run, you just had to like go back and forth with the joystick forever. <laughs> and your arm would cramp and your hand would cramp. And there was none of this like, you know, multiple buttons and none of this like, just turn it and then the character will turn it. It was hard back in the day. I also want to let everyone know the inventor of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, grew up in Utah. He was born here. He studied engineering at the University of Utah. He said that his inspiration for Chuck E. Cheese and Atari was working at Lagoon Amusement Park. He did Chuck E. Cheese too? And Chuck E. Cheese too. I just like Nolan Bushnell from Utah. Okay. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to ask, because I feel like the Supernatural set would have been just rife with pranks. Um, a, is that the case? And B, did you ever participate or on either end of the pranks. I never got pranked. I think because I'm just so darn intimidating. <laughs> um, no, I, I was I was actually on a panel recently with uh, Sam Smith and Mark Pellegrino, and none of us have been pranked. So I don't know if that's a point of pride or disappointment. Very serious. How, how was um, how was catering on the show? How was catering? Yeah, it was good. It was good? <laughs> I don't know if like, you had a reason for it. Well, just, no. if, there's, if there's really good catering, maybe people prank more? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but I do, I have another part of, to that answer. So Ruth and I decided to play a prank one time because we wanted to get in on the fun. And um, it was one of the episodes in season 11 when um, Amara had been injured and Merlina was trying to assess you know, how much of her power she still had, and so we spent the whole episode shooting in this freezing cold, like, abandoned grain silo. All of the crew were wearing, like, thick, heavy down jackets, and Ruth and I are just prancing around in our pretty dresses. It was ridiculous. Um, but we decided, you know, the guys always prank, we're gonna play a prank. So, um, we decided, because Rowena was spending a lot of time like passing her hands over Amara's body to like sense where the injury was. So we decided in one take that she would just like give me a little, little squeeze. Um, and it would be hilarious. And so we did that and nobody reacted at all. It was just silent. So we kind of like, you know, had this infinitesimal exchange of, of looks and just kept going with the scene, and then when the director said cut, we were like, you guys, you guys, we are trying to get you to laugh. And they were like, huh? <laughs> and here was, the, well, there were a few problems. One, they don't usually have only women in scenes. Two, and this is not a problem, they're very respectful when they do have women. So they assumed that we were making an acting choice, <laughs> and they wanted to respect that. And be like, oh yeah, that's good, that's good, great. And so everyone just went with it. So our 
prank wound up being a prank on us because it failed horribly. And I guess next time we need to incorporate, I mean, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of farting pranks that go on with Jared. So next time we'll just do that. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, what's been your favorite scene to film? My favorite scene? Oh, I don't have one favorite. Um, let's see, one of my favorites, um, I'm oh, sorry, five different ones just went through my head. The mentalist would say, looking up in the air, back and forth like that, that's remembering. You're supposed to down these making everything secret. I'm not lying. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed in The Mandalorian that scene when I got, because it, one of the things I love about the armor is that she, she doesn't order people around. She sort of guides them to the right choice. And so the whole time we had seen her sort of, you know, she wasn't going to push Mando any farther than he was ready. So it was very satisfying in that last episode of season one to just say, you're taking care of this kid. He's yours. And for him to be like, what? Yeah, you're a clan of two. Enjoy. <laughs> and plus I got to be in a scene with Baby Yoda, so that was really awesome. <laughs> yes, and Pedro. Beautiful. But Baby Yoda wins. <laughs> oh, Mara rules, Chuck rules. <laughs> um, I'm very serious question. Okay, I'm a very serious You had to share your bed with one or the other. Would you rather share your bed with a full size um, like elephant that's quiet? Or Hold on just a sec, because I'm losing most of what you're saying. Will you take down your mask? Thank you. Would you rather share your bed with one very quiet but very large elephant or six very obnoxious seagulls? Seagulls? Yes. <laughs> It is our state bird, so be careful. I would, well, I would rather have the elephant. Wait, how is a seagull the Utah state bird? Oh, no, no, you see, you see the pioneers moved here, and crickets were attacking their crops, and seagulls came from God to save us. I, I have no words. <laughs> What was your favorite moment in the Mandalorian with your character? My favorite moment was the kicking the stormtroopers' butts. But I have to give credit where credit is due. That was not entirely me. I wanted to do it so badly. I got the script uh, like three weeks before we were shooting it, and I saw there was this big fight, and I immediately went to Ryan, our excellent fight choreographer, and I was like, I, you know, whatever I have to do, I will train nonstop, I will do this. And he, he sort of smiled at me and he patted me on the head. And he was like, oh, that's so cute. He was like, there's no way you can learn in three weeks the level of martial arts skills you need to do this. Um, but he was like, well, you can, you know, train for a few weeks and maybe do some transitions. So I did, and that was tremendously satisfying. Um, but then Lord Mary Kim, my amazing stunt woman, was the one who did that fight. And I didn't actually see it until the episode aired. So I knew there was a fight, but I didn't know what it wound up looking like. And my husband and I were sitting there on the couch watching it, and both of us just like, our jaws just dropped. We were, we had no words. And then the fight finished, and I think he said something like, well, I guess I'll go do the dishes now. <laughs> So, and when I saw how she made that fight look, I was like, okay, yeah. I mean, I would have tried really hard, but it would not have looked nearly as good as that. That's great. Now, a lot of your characters, they like the, the armor, takes this sort of, oh, I'm, I'm just sweet and gentle, and I can't hurt anybody, and, and I'll just stay still here, and then I kill you. Uh, I've seen that a lot in several of your... your a lot? Yeah, yeah. Who else? Because Amara. Also, also Amara, also in The Mentalist. You I didn't kill anyone in The Mentalist. You didn't kill anybody, but you suddenly switch to being intense and powerful after first appearing. That that seems to be something you need to test as is, is, oh no, I'm just innocent. No, wait. Right? Do <laughs> <laughs> you, you think there's any... Fun. Yep. I don't know. I'm just innocent. I don't know. Yeah, say <laughs> Come to my web, says the spider. Okay, next up we have a job. When you come back to Mandalorian, let's be real, you will. Because they can't waste you, that would be terrible. What would you, who would you like to meet most? Out of all of the characters that they introduced in season oh. two, or that they might potentially introduce in season three? I 
I really want to see what would happen if um, Bo Katan and the Armor had a conversation. Because I have a lot of questions about that, and about the old way and the new way, and, and where the, the twain shall meet. So I would like to see that. I'd also like to say hello to Moth Gideon and give him a what's what. <laughs> yeah. And you're the first one to introduce the idea of the Jedi in the Mandalorian. I know! That was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Because we do, people ask me a lot, you know, if you do the voice and the the, um, the scenes at the same time, and, and we do, but then um, they, it's really easy to do rewrites when you have a character who's wearing a helmet. You don't have to, like, match up lip movement or anything. So I remember having this ADR session where I was on the line with John, who was simultaneously working on The Lion King, like he was running back and forth between studios to like do sound editing on The Lion King and on The Mandalorian, because he's a genius. Um, and when we first shot that scene, I never said the word Jedi, and then they thought it was a little too vague, and so when they told me what that rewrite was, I just, I got chills because I got to say Jedi. <laughs> Talking about the Lion King, tomorrow we have Caleb McLaughlin on the main stage, and he was young Simba in the Lion King. So uh, we'll ask some questions about that. Coming up. Um, as someone who has studied for the last seven years, uh, what was uh, what was the best part of working specifically on a Star Wars set? Oh, and you said as somebody who studied what? Um, I've just you know done some theater, like not as a job, but just. Okay, no, I just couldn't understand what, what you said. Um, the best part of this, well, man, oh man. And, and I, don't get me wrong, I've worked with a lot of really wonderful people, like across the board, talented and gracious and generous, but it, there is another level of magic about being on a Star Wars set, especially because I, I played Star Wars, like I played Ewok Adventures in my backyard as a kid and wanted to be Princess Leia. Um, and it was just sort of, it, it didn't compute in my brain that the people who work there are so, so skilled at what they do and so giddy to be doing Star Wars. Like the, the joy is not lost on all the people that, that work there. Um, and I think what really impressed me, because I, I've never been a part of something with so much going on technically, and what really impressed me is that that never took precedence over the people. Um, and everyone communicated really well, and I feel like everyone felt heard, um, and, and I think that that is also one of the reasons Star Wars is so incredible, is that for all of the, you know, in the 40 plus years, all the changes we've seen with uh, special effects in the movies and stuff, like the heart of it is still so solid and so important above anything else. And I think that, I think that translates. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Up next. How you doing? Hi. I just want to compliment on your beauty. Why, thank you. You're welcome. Um, while filming The Mandalorian, did you ever get the opportunity to work with that enormous big screen that they control the The landscape? volume. Yes. Did you ever get to work with it? I did not. Yet? No, my the armor's uh, lair was a, a practical set, so it was a, a dome-shaped room, and they would pull out sections of the wall when they needed to shoot different angles. I saw the volume, and it really is incredible because it's, you know, there, there's a lot that gets added um, in post-production, like with green screens and blue screens, and then it looks great when you're watching it, but as an actor, it's challenging to work in those environments. And so to have the, the volume where they project whatever the world is there and you get to be a part of it as an actor, it's so fun. It's really cool. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Hopefully you'll get to work on it soon. Next question. Hi, um, so my is Supernatural related. Um, as you all know that uh, Mara and Dean are connected, uh, they have a bond and they have a share love. My question is, as one of those characters, how would you describe that love? Is it more romantic, or is it, was it like we're just bonded together, so there's that love? I love that it wasn't well defined, that it was sort of confusing to both of them, um, and I'm really glad that they didn't take it in too romantic a direction. 
Um, both because I think it was better for the characters, but also because I think I would have incurred the wrath of the fans. Um, when I, I remember when I got the script for the episode where we, the one time we kissed, one time only, Misha came up to me and he was like, yeah, I saw that script, and I said, oh, that poor girl, fans are gonna hate her. Um, yeah, I think that, I think there was an understanding and a longing that they both shared for, um, for connection. I think that the reason he was able to get through to her at the end of season 11 is because he recognized that need that she had um, to have a relationship with this one person being Chuck, um, who was family, and he, you know, he and Sam have lots and lots of ups and downs, but they're, they are also bound in a, in a different way. So, I think it was less romantic than otherwise, um, but, you know, come on, it's Jensen, like, he could have chemistry with a log. <laughs> Thank you. Now, there's so many great places that we can follow you on social media, but one of my favorites is that you have an Instagram page for your dog. My dog was supposed to be at my panel, and then my husband decided to go get lunch with his cousins. So, sorry. But yes, I do. Her name is Norma Jean Meatballs. Norma Jean Meatballs. Um, she has an armorer costume. She will be here later today. And, um, she's really enjoying all She's so friendly. She she's half French, she's half Boston Terrier. Uh, yeah. So, so 100% something that shouldn't exist. <laughs> no, this is adorable. Well, I love that, like, we, you know, it used to just be mutts. Yeah. If a dog was more than one breed. And then the ones that were inbred were like the pure breeds. And now you combine two breeds and it's this designer breed. Which, I mean, it's just a mud. She's beautiful. She's a beautiful, loving dog. Okay, next question. So, going back to Castlevania, it was a project that I didn't find until it was already on Netflix. So, I was curious what drew you to such a different project as well as because it was based on a video game and mm -hmm. you know, have a ton of success. What drew me to it is that I auditioned for it and they wanted to use me. <laughs> Seriously though, like I, I auditioned for so many things that I think, wow, this is really cool, and then nothing happens. So that was a, a voiceover audition I had done, and um, and I, I knew about the video games, and I had, I knew that there was like a graphic novel or something, but I didn't have a lot of experience with it. And it wasn't until I got there to record the first day, um, and they showed me part of the opening sequence that they'd already animated and it just took my breath away. It's so beautifully done. And I really liked the idea that there's this, with the introduction to this series that is very dark and is about, you know, about Dracula, that it's introduced with this complete humanity and this woman who is like cracking jokes to Dracula. Um, and that they, that the reason for his anger and his hatred is because she was taken away from him. I thought that that was such a, a humanizing thing to do with, with him. Um, and yeah, it just, I mean, it was such a wild ride to see where it went. Thank you. Yeah. Go check it out on Netflix. Next up, what are you dressed as? What are you? <laughs> I'm Brigitte from Overwatch. Oh, you're Overwatch. Nice. Yeah. yeah, so for the armor, every, every single one of her movements just seems so calculated and just smooth, even in fight scenes. Were there any celebrities or characters and people that you drew inspiration for when being the armorer? Um, there are a few things. One, of, I mean, the first thing was what John had said about the like samurai warriors and Kurosawa films, and that to me meant that there would be an efficiency of movement. Um, then there was also the very practical consideration that I could hardly see, and I couldn't look like the. It was really fun trying to find the language of movement of these Mandalorians, and um, we learned very quickly that anything extraneous was really distracting. So I couldn't like look down to see where I was going. It just looked ridiculous. Um, so, partly for practical reasons, I didn't want to move too quickly. <laughs> I didn't want to trip on anything, and I really did feel every time I was like taking steps forward that I was, it was an act of faith and I just had to trust. Because Emily in real life, you know, would have been like checking and making sure and she wouldn't do that. She's very confident. 
And then just, I, I sort of didn't even realize this while it was happening, but Deborah Chow is such a strong but soft leader. And so I found, and I was working with her on those first couple of episodes, and um, so I found myself really drawing from her. And I, I didn't quite realize that until later, but it was just lucky that she happened to be there because she carries that authority without being overbearing, without being aggressive. There's a softness to it, and so she, she played into it a lot. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. You, someone may need to help you with the microphone. Someone help her. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I have a weather, would you rather question for you. Oh, okay. So, would you rather be in a horror movie, being the main character and having it real realistic, really realistic, or be the main character in a very fancy movie? A very fancy movie? Like what? There's some really fancy ones. And for the horror movie, you get paid. I mean, that's such a specific question. Um, it would really depend on the, the, the character, I guess. Whichever character I liked more. But the fancy movie would be like a princess or a queen. Oh. So what, low budget horror movie or a high budget no, princess or queen? I would only get paid a dollar for the fancy movie, yeah. right? And a hundred dollars for the... Oh, so it's, so it's about yeah, yeah. money, too. For the scary movie, it's very, very realistic. Very realistic. Does that mean I'm going to get killed? No. Or was I like, kind of finger or something? If they ask me to be in Saw 23, I'm going to say no. <laughs> um, I think I... Well, I, I guess I, I would do the fancy movie. It sounds safer. <laughs> And I like that it's just fancy. We don't know what it is, it's just fancy. How about the difference? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your Thank question. She, she looks so sweet in that angel costume. Okay, next question. Um, so given your musical performance background, what advice would you give for someone preparing to calm nerves or adjust in performances in general? Oh man, yeah. That comes into play so strongly with singing. Are you a singer? Yes, and on stage here. Yeah, um, yeah. You can't hide it when you're singing because you you need your breath support, and if you're nervous, it oh, it's the worst. And I used to have so much trouble auditioning for musicals because I would get so nervous. Um, preparation, preparation, preparation. I think for anything, whether you're singing or not, being prepared is is absolutely vital because you want to get to a place where. The thing, like in a very general way, that I think is most that is most challenging about acting is you are trying to get to something very vulnerable and intimate and personal when you are usually in a space where there are a million distractions. So you know you have an audience and here, and make no mistake, when you're up on stage, like you know an audience member. Um, I remember one time I was doing this play in, in college, and my character talked to the audience. And, uh, and it was a really, it was like a three hour long play and it was not the most brilliant production. And there was this line I had in the third act um, where I said, and, and now our play is done. And somebody in the audience said, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> when you're on stage, you notice everything that's happening. If somebody's eyes are closed, you definitely see that. If somebody's like fidgeting, you pick up on that. Um, and similarly, when you're on a set, you're really, you know, you're, like people often ask me how it was to, to kiss Jensen, and I have to remind them that like this was not you know some romantic getaway with the two of us. It was like on a set with hundreds of people watching, hundreds of people trying to fit into a space and you know not distract. Um, so I think you have to be so prepared because you have to be able to block out all those distractions and access that humanity. I think that that's the most important thing. Technically speaking, I think you know doing breathing exercises and, and arriving. I mean, it's so simple, but like getting there early so that you're not feeling rushed if it's an audition, I think that that comes in very handy. So it's a lot of really simple things that, that I think make you most prepared to then have the freedom to have that, those, hopefully those moments of genius where you can really shine. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, good luck. I like the shirt that says, yikes. 
Or does it say Vice? Vice? Is it Vice? It's Yikes. It's Yikes. Uh, so obviously one of the coolest things about the Mandalorians, just in general, are the, you know, the incredible armor that they wear. Um, and so I was just wondering, because, you know, sometimes actors get a little bit of a say in, like, their costume and things in shows and TV. Did you have any say in, like, the helmet that you got to wear as the armor or anything? Not in the design of it, um, but in the practical aspects of it. You know, I let them know what would help me see better and stuff like that. But no, I'm, I'm, I mean, they came up with something far beyond what I would have imagined. And that was actually my first sort of deeper insight into who this woman was because I, I did the audition and I knew the character was masked, but I had no idea in what way. Um, and then I went in for my first costume fitting um, and I didn't have a script or anything yet. I didn't, really didn't know anything. And they started doing a, a cast of my torso. They said they were going to do this, you know, to build this armor. But I still hadn't seen anything. And, and then they realized at some point that I had no idea what they were talking about. And they were like, oh, nobody's shown you what this character looks like? And I said, no. And they showed me the sketches. And I mean, I couldn't come up with something like that. I think it's magnificent. Yeah, she has one of the coolest men yeah, Pedro even was like, how come your helmet's cooler than mine? Because <laughs> she made it. This is the way. This is the way. Thank you. All right, we have, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end, so we'll take these last two questions, and then we'll start to wrap up. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm Vicky, and I have a supernatural question for you. Um, so, I know that at least by reputation, the boys have um, a remarkable knack for practical jokes and pranks uh -huh. uh, on set or behind the scenes. And I was curious uh, what you maybe observed or witnessed or heard about or maybe experienced firsthand in terms of their uh, playful way of working with other arms. Um. Did you come in late? Because we talked about it earlier. I did. I got oh, I'm sorry. I'll tell you the story afterwards. Um, I will say, I think the biggest prank that they're able to pull is that, you know, on camera they look great, but in real life they're so ugly. <laughs> it's just hideous, like it's painful to look at them. They needed that makeup. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> we'll talk afterwards. Come to my table and I'll tell you the story. Well, hello, Amara. Hello. This is a very last minute cosplay, so I'm going to pull up. Love it. Um, I was just wondering, have you taken anything from any of the shows home with you, like a prop or a costume? Why would I tell on myself? <laughs> Everyone does. <laughs> um, I, people, I have a helmet at my table, and people ask me if it's the helmet, and it's not. Um, a fan made it for me. Um, and I, it just makes me laugh because I feel like I would get shot by a Disney drone if I tried to take something. <laughs> but Supernatural, um, I did wind up uh, with some of, like, Amara had this really amazing pair of boots that she wore in season 15. And uh, I went out and bought those. I didn't take the ones from set. They wouldn't let me. Um, <laughs> What have I taken? Mostly theater stuff I've gotten to keep things afterward. I haven't really, I've gotten to keep some, well, I got to keep a lot of wardrobe from SEAL Team, which was very practical because it's just everyday clothes. Not that exciting, but you know, one less shopping trip. Um, trying to think of something, because I know that there's more fun like props that I've gotten to keep, but nothing's really coming to mind. So... It's a secret, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it works. I guess, I guess if you go to Nathan Fillion's house, he is Firefly. You know, I mean, he has kept everything. So it's always interesting to see what different individuals keep. So, so where do you see your, your career going from now? Are you going to pursue more musical theater, more stage theater, more television, more film, more? Would you just audition for anything that comes up? Or, or do you have a path that you're hoping to go on now? I mean... I'm, the thing that is frustrating and delightful about what I do is I never know where it's going. Um, I audition for hundreds of things a year that I don't get, like literally hundreds. And so I've gotten a little more selective as I've 
I've been doing it longer. There are certain things that I'm like, yeah, I don't think I want to do that kind of thing anymore. But I love the variety of things that I have gotten to do. I'm really open to a lot of different experiences. What would I like to do? Um, I do want to get back to not necessarily musical theater, um, but more singing. And I keep trying to put together an album, um, and I keep sort of losing losing the uh, focus to do that. And also, I've been traveling nonstop for conventions. Um, but that is something I want to do. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy just being surprised by by uh, where this this crazy career has led me. I mean, there's no way I ever thought that I would be in Star Wars. <laughs> like, you don't, you don't wish for things like that because the chances of it coming true are so slim. And so then it's a wonderful surprise. My last two questions really quick. What's something that's not as popular of what you've done that you would like us to make sure to go and see you at? Um, I'm always delighted when people come up to my table and say that they've seen, I did an episode of Flight of the Concords. Yes, Flight of the Concords. You, you know that show? Yes. yes. You were a mermaid. I was, I was a lovely lady mermaid slash women's water polo player, like you do. And it was so much fun. It was just, uh, yeah, go check that out. It was on HBO, I think. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the one that I would say. And what is, what is something that is really well known that we should all go out and watch right now if we haven't already? I would say The Mandalorian over Supernatural only because it's less of a time commitment. Three episodes? Less than how many episodes? Well, you can watch the entire series of The Mandalorian and it's only 16 episodes total. Right. If you commit to watching Supernatural... Ten years! who have binged the entire show in like three weeks and that's... You did it? Okay. Everyone, let's give a big round of applause for 